Um, I mean, she got away with it. <laughs> um, what do independent media makers in films like Project Cashmere bring to the table in terms of what we call responsible storytelling? Well, I think that um, from the point of view of, of um, the Ford Foundation and myself and, and as a filmmaker, and uh, in many ways the reasons why we uh, started partnering with ITVF on this project to to bring films from other parts of the world to the United States, but also to also um, recognize the value of the, the films that they produce about um, 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 you know, people and lives in this country, is that when you look at a film like this, you're immediately confronted with the um, the the story behind it. Um, we we in in a short clip like that, you you you're confronted with a with a with a the immense impact of migration and movement in the world and how we leave homes and, and go to other places and the, the, the large implications of that not only on the place that you leave but on, on your, your very life and, and how you, um, you live with the memories and the, the connection to those places. But at the same time, we, 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 you know, for me, I, I live in this, you know, we were talking about all of the, the impact of new media and um, how it affects our lives. Well, I can't remember a phone number anymore. I hardly remem remember names because there's so much information that we're taking in every day. But uh, storytelling and narratives like these, they stay with us. They have real impact in not just in, in, our, um, uh, in what we remember and how we recall things, but it has real impact in terms of how we uh, begin to use that to make sense of a much more complicated world. And I say complicated because we're confronted by so m with so much of it now. We have so much contact with it. Um, so in many ways, when, uh, when we first started working at ITVS, and I want to go back to that because it was, at the, um, uh, it was not long after um, uh, uh, 2000, uh, 9 11, and, uh, and I had just arrived at the foundation, and there was a, a, a real concern about how much the American public had knowledge, how much knowledge we had of other, other parts of the world and other people in the world. And we realized that, yes, there was a need to kind of enlarge the um, international reporting and um, and to work with NPR on things like that. But it was also important to, to bring real life stories to people that in fact, um, there was a real opportunity when you um, produce um, content around people's lives, you bring all the, the, the issues that they are confronting, but you also begin to understand that um, they're not just living in those issues and their, li their lives are not just different from ours, but there's so much that, that, that we share, that we all want to have access to knowledge and we all want information we all want security and we want dignity. But at the same time, I think we, we, um, we all want to be able to freely express ourselves. And in that moment of free expression, that, that moment when in fact you're looking at stories, you understand that there's opportunities to see what we share. And I think that has so much, uh, a lot to do with this idea of how do you use narratives and stories to teach better. It is in that moment when in fact we recognize that we might have difference of agreement around political or ide ideological differences but there's so much that we also share in terms of what we want from our lives and what we have to deal with in our lives and what we live with and what is most important in our lives. So we felt that these narratives um, coming, uh, this, this two-way highway of narratives is a very important thing to be a part of and to, to support, uh, especially in, these issue, in, in an effort to try and bring a sense of what does it mean to engage the, a conversation of peace and on what terms are we going to start that, that, that uh, conversation. And often it is where you find those moments of, of, um, of shared interest and, sh and shared experiences. Pat, um, how, how does the, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense that these sorts of things are on a public media platform, but how does public media stake out this middle ground where this kind of storytelling and conversations around them can happen? And where does it get the credibility that's been so endangered everywhere else? Well, the credibility is very, very important, and um, I think it's significant that even after 40 years of, of public media, I think because of it, um, the American people rank PBS and NPR as the most trusted organizations, way up on the trust meter. And, and one of the reasons, even though sometimes it's breached, there is a firewall that we are committed to of independence for filmmakers and creators, content producers. And this firewall um, means that um, people can speak their mind and they have an opportunity, more importantly beyond a soundbite, to tell the story. You really can't uh, give a story dignity if you're trying to fit it in 
a, a three second spot or, or a tweet. Um, you really need time to get to know the person behind the story. I thought this clip was so amazing because we were all left thinking, did she have tea? Is she going to have tea? Is, is it going to be that easy? You know, with, with all the barriers. And you want to get to that part where you are sitting down and you're having tea. In order to do that, you really have to find, um, some people say compassion. I, I, I would just go for something um, not as far as compassion, just a connection. That this person is not the other. There are these differences, but only through story, authentic storytelling, can we start nodding, oh, well, you know, that's me, or that's my mother, or, or that's somebody I know, I know you. And unless you get to the I know you part, uh, then nothing ever happens, because uh, the disconnect that is promoted over and over with all of the benefits we have through constant communication, um, there's a huge disconnect as well for what passes as meaningful communication. So I, I truly believe public media's role is more important than ever before and that we have an opportunity to step up to the plate um, and move beyond a lot of the wonderful things we're already doing, but to intensify our storytelling through ITVS, through other new storytellers who have a point of view and who really need a seat at our public television and radio and online table. Because of, I've said many times, it's their table. Nir, um, it seems like your network has really shaken up the media landscape in Pakistan since it was launched in 2002. Um, how do you combine your network's brand of responsible storytelling with the demands of your marketplace? Thank you. Um, since this is an event on peace, let me begin by saying salam alaikum to you all, which in our language means uh, peace be upon you. Um, so I'm actually right now uh, on a sabbatical. Uh, I'm at, uh, at, at Harvard and uh, uh, for a year because of my wife. Uh, she wanted to do a sabbatical, so I had to join her. <laughs> um, and uh, so there was this uh, course I took, very interesting one, probably the most infamous professor uh, known for uh, a lot of uh, wonderful insights, philosophy, but also his obnoxious nature. And at the end of the class, he is trying to make this great epiphany point to us. And, uh, you know, I haven't been really understanding much, but uh, everybody else seems to be really, uh, really into it. So at the end, uh, you know, I raised my hand and I said, Professor, uh, I am confused. And uh, all of a sudden, this pin drop silence. Everybody is like, <laughs> what the hell have you done? And uh, he's, he seems to be a little bit, uh, a little bit upset. So he walk walks up close to me and leans over, everybody's like, you know, silent, looking at what's happening, and he goes, Neer, that may be progress for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I finally understood the value of confusion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, uh, part of media, I think, you know, no jokes aside, uh, is to help each other be confused about each other. And uh, so we, uh, in that attempt, tried to do that uh, January 1st uh, this year. The largest uh, media group in India and the largest media group in Pakistan. Uh, we began uh, with the headlines in our newspapers, which my family business owns, with this tag which said, in India it said, love Pakistan. And in Pakistan it said, love India. <laughs> and uh, you know, we confuse a lot of people. <laughs> But at the end, it was, it was basically a, it's a peace campaign called Aman Ki Asha, which is a passion for peace. And uh, that's how it began. And uh, eventually, we have a peace album as well out with the largest, most popular singers in both India and Pakistan uh, performing. We are making money out of it. I'm uh, not uh, ashamed to tell you. We have uh, the largest record label in Pakistan, the Times of India Group, which is our counterpart in India. They have a very healthy record label business as well. So in the name of peace, we make some money as well on the side. Uh, so <laughs> we have an events company, both countries. Uh, so you know, there's a huge potential for economic and peace dividends, which is our first conference just finished in Pakistan. And a sequel is happening in, in Delhi now in about three weeks. And we're trying to show the campaigns going on both our medias in television and in print and on billboards 
and we've actually calculated, you know, what this value of, of what is the value of these. And we're trying to bring those who value it with those who perhaps think it's piece at too, too much of a price. And we want to understand that those are legitimate concerns and see what happens when we bring them together. So at the end, uh, you know, your question was, how do you do it responsibly uh, and also keep in mind your, your brand? So we try to look for sweet spots. As at the end, we are a business organization. The sweet spot would be uh, an area where you can both uh, survive financially, but also increase your brand value. Uh, so, uh, you know, in our part of the world, uh, in our sector, uh, uh, even bad publicity is, is good, right? So uh, even being infamous at first for trying to confuse people between how they feel about each other across the border, so you have a, uh, a conflict for 60 years. At first, uh, it, it seemed uh, a lot of infamity and notoriety, notoriety, but slowly it's converting into something that uh, is giving us a lot of respect as well as a financial gain. Interesting. So, Rachel, I wanted to ask, um, as the President's Council on Arts and Humanities, you also have obviously have to think about the intersection of public interest in the entertainment industry, and you're doing some work with artists and in Hollywood. Um, you have, the, I guess, the most powerful entertainment industry in the world, um, how do you get them involved, and, and what role do you think they can play in this kind of storytelling? Um, th this is interesting. The President's Committee has both uh, uh, on it the heads of all the federal cultural institutions uh, here in D.C., the NEA, the NEH, the Secretary of State, the Department of Education, um, the Librarian of Congress, and then it has a group of private individuals uh, that are appointed by the President's administration. And this committee, I'm fortunate to have really an incredible breadth and depth of, of private members, including um, some very famous actors and celebrities and a lot of people who work in Hollywood. And there is, um, you know, especially on this group, which is somewhat self-selecting, uh, a, a huge appetite for trying to figure out how to use their powers for good and how to um, engage and how to help the messaging. Um, and, you know, a number of them are doing that in their own jobs and their own in their own lives and um, uh, and just trying to use these these you know, really tools of huge mass communication and, and in some ways the primary vision of America that the rest of the world sees uh, to, to, to bridge boundaries and cross old cultures and, and, and create these kind of connections. Um, you know, where there is no sort of coordinated effort. It, it, it takes a place in studios that, you know, uh, put extra effort and maybe don't get so much return on films that they feel like has a strong international message. It takes the... Uh, format, especially in my committee, of celebrities who are willing to spend their very valuable time and energy, you know, going out to unglamorous places and talking to people and using just the attention that they garner just by showing up somewhere to draw attention to, mm -hmm. to some of these other issues. Um, you know, I, I wanted to say, to say something which might be a little bit off point. Um, there's really two ways, I think, that storytelling can help in this effort. And one is, you know, it's really well exemplified by the the clip that we saw, and it's using a story about an incredibly uh, uh, sensitive and fraught subject to uh, diffuse it, to create empathy and compassion by the story that you're telling. Um, and then there's another way, which is something that, that we're actually uh, focused on in one of our projects with the committee, which is using stories which may not have uh, uh, a particularly explosive theme to create an opportunity for dialogue, which may have a universal theme, but it creates an opportunity for dialogue and outreach into other countries where you do the same thing. You create confusion in a good way about uh, how people see America, how much we have in common versus how much we, uh, we, we don't. And we have a program that uh, sends, that pairs international and uh, American independent filmmakers and sends them to embassies all over the world. And embassies use these filmmaker pairs in their films as outreach tools, not only in the capital city, but in um, uh, you know, the environs of the country to hold master classes in universities, to screen these films, to hold Q&As. And we just had a program thinking about this uh, in Beijing, or in China. And there was a screening in Beijing with 800 Chinese students, um, university students. And the film that they screened is not, I think, anything that would be on this panel. It's called I Count Among Us. It's a you know, contemporary take on Ken Burns' jazz series, but with contemporary jazz musicians talking about jazz and an art form and how it's created and what improvisation is. And the dialogue that went on with these 800 students was fascinating because they were so confused by the idea that jazz didn't have rules. And how did it work when you don't know who's supposed to go next and you don't know when you're supposed to stop and there's no clear 
And it led to this really interesting discussion about the difference between Chinese and American societies and the ways that we approach rules and the ways that, you know, free will and, and, and spontaneity is addressed. And, you know, it, it didn't talk about nuclear buildup or, uh, you know, the ethnic tensions in the, in the north of China, but all of those people walked out of that screening, both the Americans and the, you know, and the students with kind of an insight into the different ways that our societies can work without a judgment about which is right and wrong. And so storytelling can be used because you're telling a story that creates empathy or connection, or because you're telling a universal story that then creates a platform. You were saying, you know, that public media is really focused on community outreach now, that this creates an opportunity of dialogue around common and interesting themes that can also break down some of those mm -hmm. some of those boundaries. Gita, I'm not going to ask if she went in for tea. Mm -hmm. I want everyone to watch the show. <laughs> but I do want to ask, how do you make a pitch for something like that with all the noise that's going on? I mean, how do you do it? For a film like this? Yeah. Well, I think it takes more than me. It takes it takes an uh, organization like ITVS, it takes an organization like the U.S. government, which sent me to Beirut and to um, Turkey this year with the program you just described. It takes uh, an audience that's willing to accept that type of material. It takes taxpayer money to make these films happen. So my pitch is actually very small in all of that. My pitch is to find the human universal voice in what I want to say mm -hmm. and make it feel like something, you know, you, you stumble your words to understand. I, I think that the fact that this is gray area, this film, is what excited Sinan and myself, my, my, the filmmaker that I work with. We, we are very much interested in asking questions and not answering them. And in the time that we're in right now, it was, it was an easy pitch, in fact. Um, we felt, as consumers of media, that we were given things in a bite-sized way and that everything was so safe, you know? You just felt like we're all dressed up and, and, and really civilized. And it's just time to break free of that. I mean, we live in a time where conflict is when you feel like you're going to throw up. Conflict is when you don't understand something. And that's not a negative feeling. And it was time to really get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And also to understand, and as consumers, again, starting with ourselves, think, wait a minute, I don't like it when someone just sits there and starts telling me information. And we wanted to make a documentary that made people feel and not feel a sense of, again, safety at the end of the film, but made you come out of the film and go, what the hell was that? I don't, I mean, I'm so confused. Everyone's so, nothing got resolved. Well, you know what? That's why the wars go on and on and on. You know, Kashmir is not over. Arthi, by the way, is here in the audience today. And, you know, she can tell you more after this. Um, you know, it's, it's the fact that we want to understand. I don't want you to sleep at night thinking that everything's okay in Israel, Palestine, or Kashmir. I want you to sleep at night because you know that there are people out there that are heroes and inspiring and are going on and trying to live in these areas, and, and you understand why they live in these areas. You know, if you're asking yourself, why, why don't people just leave the war? You know, why don't they just move out of Israel, Palestine, and, and come live in Milwaukee? Well, then you don't understand. And that's why we make these films. We wanted to just communicate those little things that are so hard to communicate in numbers and news bites. We wanted you to real, really feel something. And that's what I think, you know, like Orlando was talking about, emotional memory is where the answer is for us as people who are trying to change the world. You know, emotional memory is what we carry around with us. When we open the newspaper and we see 20 people died in, you know, um, Darfur today, well, okay, that's interesting. You can talk about it at your party. But you really, you don't care. You don't understand. I'm sorry. I don't even understand. But when you actually hear the story of someone from Darfur, one person, not 20 people, and you are there for like, I don't know, three minutes to understand just the gray area, the things you don't understand that they don't understand, then you understand. When you are confused, you understand. And that's what we need you to carry around when you open the paper every day and more people died and more people died, you know, even in Iraq. You want to understand what it comes down to, that one very undescribable feeling. So that's what this film was about, and I think every film we'll ever make will be about is emotion behind the news that we're, that we're all working together to create. So we work very, very closely with journalists, in fact. Um, we'll open it now to questions if there's anyone in the audience who has something they'd like. Yes, sir, over here in the front. Just wait for the microphone. Oh, you have to actually hit the mic. Um, I have a, a short comment on the uh, uh, movie or whatever the spot we saw. Uh, it's about, uh, thanks to the American friends that 
it came 63 years later. I mean, this film shot would have been of some value in India or in Pakistan <laughs> probably 63 years ago because uh, there are a lot of people who suffered that kind of a fate either in parts of India or in parts of Pakistan. But today it's a little too late. But any, anyway, uh, it's interesting that at least the American audience is being educated. It probably should have more impact on our activities in Iraq or Afghanistan, I think. I'm sure there are similar situations in there. And, and if people can project that far, that may be. Now, my question is, um, uh, are these uh, uh, movies that you are making is to encourage peace? Or if that is the case, the earlier session where we had the discussion whether the media should be really seeking peace and it was d decided that they're not quite sure what, what they should be seeking. But in my opinion, I think if we are aiming these kinds of things at the American media, we should put them on peace diet because, uh, because we've been going through too many wars. Uh, when I say too many, I'm an American citizen who was born in India. So I guess she was introduced as an Indian American. We are not Indian American. We are American citizens who were born in India. <laughs> so I, I would say that we, we are really concerned that America is too much on a war path, one after another. I've said, said America is almost following the path that Adolf Hitler really took and which, which really blew the world up. So if this is an attempt, so President's Council and all of the mu movies you should be making to make sure that we don't venture on another war. Thank you. I, I think that one of the things that, um, you know, from a point of view, why, why, can, why make narratives like this is to try and uh, create an opportunity for greater understanding, but also to kind of bring people into the, uh, not only the conversation, but the action to do something about what they see uh, as, as important issues that affect, affect all of our lives. I've got two people in, in the last, in the last um, panel, there was a lot of discussion around truth. I think in many ways, uh, we look, are looking more for honesty that within the story there's an honest representation of multiple truths possibly within a space because I think in understanding that in a diverse world that we live in, there are multiple truths to a moment. And we try to bring that to the, the complexity of these, these pieces. But it's not just about the film itself. It's really at a, at a moment when in fact you've, you've uh, reached people and they are moved by it and they want to do something about it. What do you do at that moment? And this is where we're coming back to what something Pat was saying that a large part of this is not just the, the uh, the, the narrative itself, but what do you do when people are affected by it? How do you allow them to have an ability to respond? Now, we see a lot of this happening now in uh, when we see catastrophes in the world, like the, the earthquake in Haiti. People responded by giving money, and there are opportunities to kind of go there. But I think that there are many other ways in which people want to be involved. They might want to be involved in understanding. They might want to be involved in in in, in uh, donating their time and, and participating in helping to change or do something like that. Or it might even be a thing where you, s you realize that, in fact, your skills have real value in, in solving that problem. How do you help create spaces where, in fact, these kinds of things can happen? I think that part of what we're looking at in terms of a, 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 a new kind of connected environment that we're, we're living with in the, with the Internet and other kinds of new technologies allows us to do those kinds of things. How we or how filmmakers and how, how organizations like Ford or others think about how, in fact, you create those, 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 those opportunities to connect people to those things, I think is a big part of taking the narrative to the next stage, where, in fact, people can be actively involved and be a part of change. I think change, as, as someone says, change doesn't, change happens really from people. Major social change in the world was about people rising up and deciding they were going to change. It doesn't come, that, and it usually starts with a question. Someone asking a question. They've seen something, experienced something, and they ask the question and they want to get answers. And how do you, how do you capture those moments and move with them? And I think that's a, another large part of what we're challenged with when we think about the power of a narrative like, like Deepa's. What do you do with that? How do you help people uh, connect with that? And the film doesn't just show in the U.S. The idea is that, obviously, we're tr you, you're making it available to everyone. And you're using all the ways possible to do that, from traveling to a, a nation and sitting in a, in a room and talking directly with people and engaging in conversation, to making it available so that people could have it in many different forms and meeting them where they are. And that's the other big work that I think is a part of this kind of work that we're doing around narratives. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was thinking um, as you were speaking, 
um, no tidy uh, solutions at the end. And we've all been conditioned uh, through uh, a sitcom so that um, at the end, uh, whatever, somebody cries, the dog barks. And it's, it's, you know, we can be aware that that's what's happening, but it's been an enculturation over so many years that as Americans, we really do want that ending. We really want to know so we can move on and not be so much bothered by thinking about it, you know, that this is going to be taken care of. And I think more and more, public media has such an important role to play in not providing those answers, imposing the challenges. And I, I just can't say enough about the work of ITDS. Um, some of the things that, that we're going to be doing, I can't talk about because the contract, as usual, is <laughs> you know, done. But um, an issue such as human trafficking. Nobody wants to watch this. This is painful. Where are you going to see this? Because at the end, what are you supposed to do when you find out that there are no heroes in this thing, that it is a huge financial boon to so many countries? So it really leaves you with, how do I, as a person, let's just say minimal goodwill, what do I do so that somebody else's daughter or son doesn't have to live through this hell because it all touches us? So these are the kinds of things that really get us to focus in a way that we come to our own conclusions. And one of the things that Orlando talked about, how do you move people to do things? I was so impacted by, by the exchanges. I just want to say, even though I'm not there any longer, it's the best investment, other than public media, that the American people can make in terms of the, the exchange program. Because so many people change so many lives, not their own, but Americans' lives, by living in their homes, by talking about their families. And one of the most powerful things, two, two messages came out of it. One, the majority of people who came here would talk about, even now, the volunteer ethic of Americans, how even beyond giving money, we're willing to help out, we're willing to do something, and, and it's, it's the positive of who we are. And the other thing is the freedom, the freedom we take so for granted. And we had this one young man. We, I started the first Arab Muslim exchange high school with the help of the late Ted Kennedy and Richard Luger. And they were spending a year in a high school. And this one young man, I won't say what country, he called after three months living with a family in Iowa. He said, you've got to get me out of here. And uh, the, the sponsor said, why? He said, well, the police are going to come in any day. Why? Well, this family, every night when the news comes on and President Bush talks, <gasps> they curse and they're just cursing and cursing, and I know they're going to be in terrible trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and more profound than any lecture, any brochure, was the idea that that's what we do. We curse and curse, <laughs> and we don't get in so much <laughs> It's true. Mira, I have a question. Um, what is the role of the marketplace in storytelling, and do these kinds of stories sell? Um, yeah, I haven't figured that out properly yet. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I do think that benefit of doubt, more benefit of doubt, should be given to the silent majority and to uh, consumers and viewers. Um, for example, I we, we did this uh, movie which I'm holding in, in my in my hand. It's called uh, Khuda <laughs> Ke Liye, and it, it means uh, in the name of God. And um, so this movie it's about these two brothers. Uh, one believes in fundamentalism, the other believes in fundamentals. Both of them are musicians at first, but the other brother ends up in Afghanistan fighting jihad. And the other brother thinks nothing wrong with music and Islam, so uh, I think they're both compatible. So we um, he ends up in America uh, learning about music as a degree. The brother in Afghanistan, he uh, basically, when he goes to the jihad, he fi figures out that you know these fundamentals uh, weren't really part of Islam, and we beat the fundamentalism out of him. Um, but then the other brother who's here in America, 9-11 happens, mistaken identity, and he ends up in Guantanamo Bay, and there we beat the liberality out of him. Mm. And what the movie does, basically, it, uh, it, it condemns suicide bombing, and it also makes music halal because it uses the narrative of uh, Prophet David 
Dawood al-Islam, who was given this tool of music. So it proves through Islamic texts that actually music cannot be haram. And uh, there was a red mosque issue going on in the middle of Islamabad at that time. I don't know if you remember. It was in this uh, under siege about only a mile away from the parliament building by this terrorist. A huge issue. And that guy actually gave a fatwa against this movie, saying if Dio is allowed to launch this film without me censoring it, uh, the government will be responsible for what happens next. And uh, we were all very scared. We still went ahead with this. And you'll be very happy to know that even though this is not a typical Bollywood movie, and I really thought that this is going to be a just a passion express, a complete write-off, it became the number one box office hit of Pakistan. So, and I was shocked by this. And, you know, I went to three or four focus groups, and I went to the cinemas as well just to see what people were responding to. And they were clapping on those very instances, which I thought, you know, my maybe liberal or progressive upbringing or my thirst for that progressive Islam was, was clapping inside me, but the entire audience was clapping at those same very moments. So it's about, I think, also having a little bit of faith in the silent majority of Pakistan. Right. Uh, you know, this Aman Ki Asha, for example, you know, m I don't know how many Americans think that that could have happened during the Cold War, that if you woke up in the middle of the, mo you know, in the morning and the, the New York Times or the Post said, you know, let's love Russia, and I don't know if Russia could say let's love America, but it's, it's happened in India and Pakistan. So we should give a little bit more benefit of doubt. Okay, so right, Rachel, and then Geetha. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't mean to speak as the mouthpiece of Hollywood because uh, I don't <laughs> actually live there. I did grow up there. But, um, you know, I, I think that for better or for worse, and, and this really gets back to the importance of public media, that the American commercial film industry has, has, has made the decision that these stories don't, not made the decision in any kind of conscious way, but has come to the conclusion that these stories uh, don't sell in the way that other ones do. And you look at what something like a film like Invictus did at the box office versus whatever the one that's out now about Jennifer Lopez who has a baby and then meets a guy and <laughs> wants to marry him, you know, and you really, y y you see that. And also from my own committee, you know, I have some of the more passionate and civically involved um, actors on my committee and they all have a pet project with a, a theme that we would all applaud that they've been trying to get made for 10 years, and they're the biggest celebrity, you know, they're, they're, they're the heavyweights. And so, um, you know, that kind of top-down storytelling, I think, is really problematic for the American commercial media. Um, and then you have other, interestingly, um, you know, approaches. Uh, uh, Frank Hutzel, who's in the audience here, and I know somebody named uh, Cynthia Schneider, who, I don't know if she's here, but she works with an organization in L.A. whose whole uh, job in a very kind of non-judgmental way is to promote accurate representations of Muslims in, in you know, commercial media. And her sort of poster child is 24, and she's, you know, this organization has worked with them a lot about the way that Muslims are represented in, you know, that particular series, and she worked with another, uh, a lot of other ones. And over the course of whatever, seven season, seven seasons, you know, in the first three, I think Muslims were all the bad guys, and in the last two, they were actually the good guys. And that's something that she's very proud of. And so there's another aspect of it, not trying to, not necessarily, or both at the same time trying to get those stories told through the commercial media, but also trying to make the stories that are already being told that are perceived as commercial reflect uh, some themes and more accurate information than we sometimes see through the kind of Hollywood lens. Hi, Geetha. Yes, I was just going to share um, two stories that, that perhaps allow you to see how, how I'm struggling as a filmmaker to, to meet these challenges because, you know, you make a documentary and a lot of times you get people who watch documentaries. You get people who actually know quite a bit and are very open-minded um, to watch that material and who are always struggling to get more distribution, differentiated distribution. When, when we were in Kashmir making this film, it took, um, it took about eight years, and when we finished, I was sitting around having a beer with one of the Kashmiris, and I won't tell you who he is because our beer will go paddle. But we were, you know, he was Muslim and I'm Hindu. And we're joking around, we just made this whole film, you know, to change the world and bring more diversity and get people to talk to each other. And he goes, oh, Gita, you know, this whole time I was going to tell you, I think you're so cute, you know, and I just want you to know that. And I was like, thank you. And he says, you know, it's too bad we will never date. And he kind of sits back and he starts laughing, and that's it. <laughs> and I... I, the, here's the thing, and I'm going to be honest with you. I started laughing too. I was like, yeah, why not? You know, and it was this very profound moment for me. I had just spent eight years of my life making a film about tolerance, 
making a film about how we should all get along and please our s- you know, the other in us, all this bullshit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and and I and I was I had not changed at all. And so I realized there was another film to make. The challenge was, wait a minute, let's, let's look at what's happening with Project Kashmir. I'm, I, I made this film, it's on ITBS, I'm really excited, but I want more people, even more people than that, to watch this next film. How do we get the people who watch The Backup Plan, which I know the name of, <laughs> <laughs> how do we get people who watch those YouTube videos to watch what we're making about tolerance? Mm. So what is it that's out there? That what are you guys going to watch tonight when you go home? Certainly not my documentary, because mm. you've had enough today, right? Yeah. You want to go watch a rerun of something, something funny, right? Or, or maybe you want to watch an action movie. Those are the two things that get distribution in this country and around the world. So let's go for it. Why not, mm. right? So the next film is about semi-arranged marriage. It's about love, and it's a romantic comedy documentary. And ITBS has been so incredibly wonderful to, to – um, to make this possible. And it's exciting to bring humor into documentaries even more. And there are so many documentaries that have been um, very, very, um, you know, they, they have actually paved the way for films like this. This is not the first. But it's exciting. So that's what the next film is about. It's why you, you say that you're tolerant, but will you go out with a black girl? Will you go out with a Muslim? Will you go out with, are you Jewish? Are you going to date someone who's not Jewish? Let's talk about it. Because isn't this the root of change in the world is our individual choice? Doesn't that dictate how we feel in these, you know, macro, macro discussions when we look at the other? We don't really understand, do we? So that's the first thing, which I think is really exciting, is bringing humor, you know, really going with what's commercial. The second thing, and I'll make it quick, is um, action films. This drives me crazy. I just went to Turkey and Belarus with your program, and it was really great to take Project Kashmir out. And the one thing that frustrated me, I'll be honest, is that no matter where I went, how remote, you know, if they didn't have water, they had a VHS of The Terminator and some other action movie, and they had seen it a million times. They may not read the newspaper, but they watch these films. And so I kept, I came back, and I couldn't have stopped thinking about it. Well, I don't know if it's just the way it is in life, how things just come together, but I have spent um, about 10 years of my life as an apprentice screenwriter in Hollywood, and I had worked on action films. I didn't know why. It just, it was the job I got. And I worked for The Rock, and I worked for, you know, Blue Crush and Fast and the Furious. I'm thinking, there's something here. There's something here. And so I wrote an action film that basically would penetrate the action market. And it has a total social message, which is the story of the other. And it's hard to explain, but the producers of The Matrix have been wonderful in coming aboard, and we're making the film. And I don't know if you're ever going to see it. I don't know if it's going to see the light of day, but I'm not even going to talk about that option. We're going to do it. And we need to do more of this. All of us need to do more of this. We need to create material that feeds the beast. You know, we can't just sit back here and make our little um, films. I understand this now. You know, I can't just keep making my films and then getting upset with the people that get distribution that's bigger than ours. We have to work together with the people that, that do that. So I think your work is really important and interesting for that reason, as is yours. Okay, can we take some questions? Yes, to the lady in the back there. Thank you. Just wait for the microphone. Hello, I'm Marta Llanes from Peru, and I'm fascinating to have this possibility to be with all of you here. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of storytelling, for me to bring about storytelling is to bring a, a appreciation and a big tribute to original indigenous people, because we have to remember that storytelling comes as a very basic form of communication in round circles from original people. So this is a first appreciation that is nothing that comes from today's uh, world, but is something that pays tribute to what we have learned by generation. Second thing, this richness of diversity, but also in the area of peace building, I like to remind, for instance, years back, I saw fantastic four films by a fantastic filmmaker, Deepa Mehta, with uh, water, dealing with the, the issue of widows, uh, early marriage, a widow at eight years old. Then we have fire, the situation what happened with love between Pakistan to a couple from Pakistan and India. And I think excellent films. I realize, I used to live in Nepal for many years, I realize how much uh, anger in many people uh, these, pe- these films uh, uh, brought about. So, because people like to see, as you, uh, one of the uh, presenters say, don't like to see these aspects that really confront with our own consciousness. 
we all like to live in a very comfortable zone, and this is what happened to the other. I heard in this panel use the word other very much, and I wonder who is the other, and what is the truth, and how we, based on what is an, our understanding of truth, really interpreted what is, uh, who is this other. So I feel that uh, using storytelling, and as you said, keeping it real, perhaps keeping it truth, although it's not a universal truth, but perhaps it's a truth that whoever sees and listens this has to discover. Opening minds, that's the most important thing in, in peace building. But so that no one has one answer for everything, but you have the possibility through storytelling and basically through many uses of art to develop consciousness. But perhaps if we follow the Freire tradition, Paulo Freire, through so all this, help us to develop a conscience about our actions. And therefore, I think uh, uh, the possibility of, uh, uh, here I see a confrontation with what we saw in the morning, we listen in the morning, or I listen in the morning, about facts. And here what we are presenting, facts in a real life story. And also perhaps we have to look as well on presenting the stories of human greatness, that in all these very difficult conflicts, there are fantastic resilient people, there are fantastic resilient women, there are fantastic resilient children, but whose stories, very little we hear about it. We only hear perhaps about this also very uh, uh, sad part, but also there is uh, a joyful part on the human being to see how human nature is so strong and so resilient that in spite of every difficult situation, we still go in life and make it for others. Thank you very much. My name is Salim Ali. I'm a professor at the University of Vermont, and I'm originally from Pakistan as well. Um, I had a, a first a comment about the influence of the popular commercial films. I, my field is environmental planning, and I work especially on indigenous issues, and Avatar is the ultimate blockbuster, the ultimate syrupy noble savage saga, and I think it has hardly changed any perceptions about environmental ethics. You know, I, uh, when I teach my students, they just kind of laugh it off. So I think you need to remember that, too, that the fact that a movie sells and has a very clear message doesn't often make a difference. But I do feel that the news media can make a huge difference in perceptions. And that's where I have a question both for um, uh, Mr. Rahman and also um, uh, our guest uh, from the government. <laughs> um, you know, there's a real challenge with regard to the news media in the U.S. and peace building, whether it's in terms of access for Al Jazeera to cable news or it's in terms of, in, in the case of Pakistan, in terms of U.S. perceptions in Pakistan. So I'm wondering if you can comment on that because that's where I think the influence can be much more potent, even if the audience factor itself may not seem as large. Who wants to take that one? Well, one of the things um, that... Um, in terms of public media, um, statistics that were done looking at coverage, international news coverage, and I was actually surprised that uh, PBS NewsHour came out on top as a coverage of international issues without a focus on the United States. And the work that NPR is doing is just amazing. And again, these are complicated issues, and the, the tendency is to want the answer and the solution. This person is bad, this is happening, this is why. And the treatment, and sometimes it's been made fun of on Saturday Night Live, you know, the NPR approach. But it takes its time, and it is balanced, and all views are presented in a way uh, for the listener and now the online participant. But, but there's some responsibility on that other end. You have to want to listen. You have to have some curiosity. And you have to sort of wean yourself off of the shorthand that we're so used to, that an hour later you're hungry for something real. So, I mean, I know I'm a walking commercial for public media, but um, I just believe in, in it so much in terms more now than ever before, ironically because we have so many choices right now, but it's a lot of nothing, so... 
Yeah, so taking off my Hollywood hat and putting on my government <laughs> hat. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have any words of wisdom here. It's, you know, me, what the future of media, right, is a huge, hugely complicated issue that everybody is struggling with, both inside and outside of, of government. And, you know, we don't have a ministry of information in this country. We don't have government-controlled media. We, thank God, support public media, which is as close, I think, as we come to that. And they do an amazing job. Um, but, you know, both in terms of the economics of the media and, and what people are listening to and what people are turn, tuning into, it's such a more complicated beast. And uh, what, what I think we can hold the White House responsible for is how they use the White House as a bully pulpit. You know, whether we agree or don't agree with what they're saying, that's what the electoral process is for. Um, you know, and, and ha what the messages are coming out of, uh, what the messages are that are coming out of the administration and the State Department and all of those. And, and how they're covered and whether they're covered well or with nuance or with um, you know, bombast is such a, such a deeply complicated issue. And I think that the control and the, the role that the government plays in that is perhaps smaller than, than, you know, than we think. Mir, I have um, something that was put in my lap here. 20% of Pakistanis thought the Taliban was a problem only a year or so ago. Today, 80% do. And you think that GOTV helped to change that? How did that happen? Who planted that question? Mm. Can't tell you. I just don't reveal my sources. <laughs> um, well, let me give some context to the situation. So one of the reasons why we were able to do this peace campaign with India is because India is no longer a public enemy number one for Pakistan. Uh, the United States is. Uh, and by a wide, wide margin. We're number one. Wide margin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I meet, uh, <laughs> and when I meet Americans, uh, you know, from the government or, or whatever, the friends, you know, they're like, why? How, how's that happening? Because, you know, if anyone knows anything about India and Pakistan, this is like not imaginable 10 years ago. And they say, what did India do? I'm like, hmm. nothing. <laughs> 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 the question we should be asking, what did America do? Right. And so, you know, I think I you got to take things in that context. Uh, so even though that part is true, that uh, I think the American approval ratings in Pakistan are borderline uh, close to the approval ratings of one president, which is, is, is not a very good place to be. Um, but at the same time, you know, yes, this, this shift has happened, that even though perhaps uh, American approval ratings will not go up, but the Taliban approval ratings have gone down quite drastically. And I think what, what happened was that this distinction was created between the Taliban's reaction as opposed to an Islamic reaction uh, to what was happening to them and what they were doing in return. And uh, there were some videos which Taliban themselves had made, and there were some videos which uh, some uh, flogging videos of uh, women who were flogged in public and, and other videos which uh, Taliban's own propaganda material on stamped was aired on television, which helped uh, create uh, you know, that distinction. And then obviously there was one or two people who had a lot of sympathy who represented the Taliban, when they were interviewed, I remember this interview went on air, and uh, he said the only time a woman should go out of the home is two times. One, uh, when she marries, and the other time when she dies. And y when, he, when he said these words, I knew that this was, you know, this is going to change now, because, uh, you know, people of Pakistan, no matter what we may think of them, uh, again, it's the whole my narrative about you know the silent majority. Um, no one's going to take that lying down. And uh, all of a sudden, public opinion changed. I mean, it also didn't help that he, on a public uh, proceeding, he also said that once uh, we get whatever we want, uh, we're going to invite the Islamic Uzbekistan movement, and we're going to invite the Al Qaeda, we're going to invite the Jashir Muhammad. So th those things also didn't help uh, his. Sounds uh, like a real charmer. <laughs> so <laughs> that's another thing, right? That's an interesting question. That as part of this, you know peace process or whatever, what percentage or how much time should we give to the so-called enemy? Mm -hmm. And in this case, it helps. In this case, it helps. So where's that fine line and, uh, and how to be fair as well to the other side? Can I, can I ask you actually a question? I'm, I'm just curious, um, just going back to government, you know, the uh, stepping aside from the larger question of how is America or the president and his rhetoric kind of presented over there, but, um, you know, th the Cairo speech, which was a big kind of placeholder for this administration. And, and I know even though it doesn't actually get reported much in the American media, even, you know, there's a tremendous amount of initiatives and energy and projects that came out of that in all uh, of the outward-looking departments, from State Department, you know, to the National Security Council, all those. Um, 
you know, how do how do American how does American rhetoric get when it's rhetoric that, that we might think you know would be would be positive? Does it not get reported? Does it get spun as in general? Does it? How so does the it United States, uh, when you guys had your elections, we uh, in Pakistan thought it was too important of election to just leave it to Americans. So the Pakistani media had the American elections as well, and uh, we did it on SMS Geo did it, and uh, we got about uh, 900,000 people voting. Uh, about 82% voted for Obama. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, 82% is better than, you know, what whatever our president or whatever our party got. So, <laughs> so I'm not saying that, you know, there's, uh, you know, people love America, but I think when, when the right things are said, right actions are said, I think just recently you had Hillary Clinton in Pakistan, and she was one of the first public officials who actually engaged Pakistanis with some of the conspiracies, you know, they have in their mind. And some of them are actually, you know, uh, there, there's some smoke where there's fire. Uh, I get asked this question about this black water business. You know, what is this black water? Why is Pakistani media so crazy about black water? And some people here, you know, very senior people, they ask me, why is this, uh, you know, why are you wearing this? Why does Pakistani media go berserk on these issues? I mean, don't you understand? Wh where do you get this stuff from? And I replied, I said, this is New York Times. <laughs> I, I don't understand. Well, why don't you guys read the New York Times? It, uh, the Blackwater issue was in the van Vanity Fairs, the New York Times, Washington Post, and the U.S. Embassy took 31 days to respond in Pakistan. And they logically, in terms of their own logic, their response was because it was such a ludicrous issue that Blackwater wants to take over Pakistani nukes. But if you look at the context of Blackwater, what is the history, what is the narrative, what do they be doing in Iraq? They should not really be in Pakistan. And then you either take 31 days to respond and then ask why the conspiracy testers it's probably not the right question to ask. It only feeds the conspiracy, right? Excuse me? It only feeds the conspiracy. Yes, uh, you know, one of the philosophies I've heard a lot in D.C. is that if we engage, we'll add fuel to the fire. And to those people, and that's why I think, you know, one of the reasons I'm here is because to those people, I'd like to challenge anyone to come and actually check how hot the fire is. Mm -hmm. There is no way you can help it burn further. At the other end of the spectrum, at least some people will be confused when you give your point of view and your narrative because some people will start, you know, uh, Adding one plus one saying, no, it's not 11. It is sometimes two. And I think that's an opportunity that is not being taken. Vijay, you'd like to say yeah, something? Yeah, I was just going to mention something if you had thoughts. Um, you know, in conflict zones or in hotbed situations, the, the information that's coming out is usually through journalists in that area. And, you know, we in America or in first world countries, a lot of times have a unit of stringers who are from those countries who give us the information. And that's such a tricky, precarious situation to be in, actually, when there is someone from, you know, um, Kazakhstan or, K or Kashmir, for example. Let's talk about Kashmir. You know, there, if, if we want to get information, even as a documentary filmmaker, we have to find someone in Kashmir who wrote an article. Or we open up the New York Times and we read whatever is in there. Or we, we watch, um, you know, a program. That's always created by someone. And that person, a lot of times, when it's when it's a third world country or, or a hotbed of situations, the people who stay usually are not someone like you. In some of these, they're people who live there, and they report the daily grind, and they're there for many many years. And in my, you know, experience in some of these places, and it's hard to get information from someone who's outside of it. And so what happens is when you don't realize who wrote that article, and who you're feeding your information off of, you kind of forget it. So let's say I'm, you know, when I'm doing research on Kashmir, I read an article. I read an article when I first started, and it, you know, I just took it as okay. That's that's how many people died. This is what happened. Well, then, you know, years later, I go back. I go, okay, this was written by a Hindu. It's totally, you know, slanted. And then I look at another article, and I'm like, oh, this was written by a Muslim. This is totally slanted. Like how, you know, very few journalists. I mean, you're, there are a lot of journalists like you that are wonderful and very experienced, and I think it's really important that you did stay in those situations. But I think it's also interesting to look at the challenges of, of these journalists who are from these areas and to figure out how to work with them and how to, how to negotiate the information coming to us as outsiders, not knowing, you know, not having 10 years or five years to figure it out a lot of times. We're last minute, you know, there's a war that breaks out somewhere or there's a situation that happens. We don't know what we're getting a lot of times. So I'd, I'd be curious to know how you deal with that in, in Pakistan as far as the information coming in and out? Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, I just read this book, uh, Greg Mortensen, uh -huh. and it was a really great quote. It, uh, it says, uh, you know, there comes a time in society where 
the best of the people lose conviction and the worst of us become intentionally passionate. Mm -hmm. And you know, we see one 9-11 brought out all the Glenn Becks and Sarah Palins in America. <laughs> and you have to imagine in this context, I don't mean to be political, uh, I, I think Sarah Palin's cute, but uh, Would you marry her? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, on the other end, you have to imagine in Pakistan's context, we are getting a mini 9-11, you know, every week. And one of, them, one of them is caused at home by our own Pakistan Taliban, and the other one is caused by your American drones. And imagine what will happen to us, well, imagine what will happen to our society and our narrative. Now, in that context, us trying to cover both point of views, yeah. especially when the American point of view is silent, and the American point of view who is sophisticated in marketing and jargons and narrative and sound bites and brand management, yet do not use that in Pakistan for some reason, because they don't add fuel to the fire. So imagine now for us trying to balance, trying to find that one person yeah. who would want to risk their lives not and, a a victim. Ta and, no, and not a victim. You know? So it, it becomes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to say the You least. know, by the way, Arthi, who, who you saw that clip on, she's, she's a journalist. Can, can Adi stand up, please? Yeah, Where are you, Adi? I know you're in here somewhere. Oh. She's a journalist. <laughs> She, she, not only is she a victim, sorry, Arthi, to call you that, but she, she's a journalist with the Times, she was a journalist with the Times of India. Muzamil, the, the other person in the film who's, who's Muslim and tells his story, he's a journalist, you know? So, so it's just interesting how that does affect what we get here, and, and it's something we need to deal with. Okay, is there any more questions? Yes, right in the back there, the lady, please, in the, in the middle. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Johnson, and I'm actually building a peace-building initiative and a smart power foreign policy approach for Northrop Grumman Corporation, looking at how we can take on peace-building from the private sector, working with U.S. government agencies. And I'm really struck in this discussion about the challenge that public media and documentaries have in capturing history. Because when I look at Gita's comment about the small story with the individual who talked to her over a beer about his interests that would never, uh, you know, be pursued, I think about history playing into people's storytelling and understanding of each other and how more of public media and documentaries need to dive into the history of these conflicts and bring out that so that human beings understand the story in that long trajectory of history. Because when that's missing, the same attitudes and feelings are perpetuated, right? Because when I traveled all over Pakistan and India from, as a businesswoman, I learned so much about how all of it was the same land. They were all the same people. And then there was the partition and how that changed everything. But having that history... And understanding that gave me perspective about where the conflict originated from and so forth. And I feel that sometimes in public media and in documentaries, because of the time limit, right, they don't allow the, the viewer to get that full history of the last hundred to thousand years that creates these conflicts. And to me, to get behind Gita's challenge for herself and for all of us as human beings, we have to dive into the history. Because every conflict has that long-standing origin that if you look back to it, right, whether it's the issues in Palestine or issues in Sudan, it's that human conflict and the history that we've never addressed. And my challenge really for public media and documentaries is how to reach the young children, right, our little children, right, your four-year-old daughter or son who is going to be learning about this and making sure they get the true history so that when they grow up, they're not challenged to take those same stereotypes into the next generation. How do we get our public media and documentaries to answer that question? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, would, I would say that um, there, there, there is a, a, a real interest in public media and history, and I think that one of the things about the products that come out of public media 
is that it does have a very long life in schools. I mean, if it's real, value, if it's, it's real, real large um, impact, is the way it does in, in become part of curriculum in schools. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's been there for such a long time. Now, I would, I would agree with you that there's not maybe enough, there isn't, there's a lot of American history, very little history in other parts of the world. And I think that is a, is a, is a, is a, is a fertile space to, to, to explore, but we're, you're also, uh, the primary audience is a U.S. audience, too. And the question is how, is, is the appetite of, of a U.S. audience to dive deep into, into histories of other lands? And I think that, I'm not saying that it's not, it's not possible to make that work, but I think it's always a big challenge in terms of deciding whether, you know, the limited amount of funds you have, you're gonna, you're gonna place it here or you're gonna place it in this other piece here, and how that is relating, how that relates to a, a, a market or, or an audience that is primarily interested in, um, you know, uh, an U.S. history. We see a lot of U.S. history on, on the, the um, public media, but I think that the real value of even any of the products that come out of, uh, of the service itself is that they all find their way into not just in classrooms as films, but also around built into curriculums and used that way in classrooms. So they are impacting a next generation that way. On, on one, one of the initiatives uh, we're funding, we're at the beginning of this, and it is uh, domestic, it's American Archives, so that all of your taxpayer monies that supported public media programs for 40 years um, will be preserved, will be made available, uh, schools, and, and we're working on copyright issues. But the challenge in terms of history it's is itself, you all know the statistics, of our own kids don't even know history from 10 years ago. And we talk about the civil rights movement and they're like, what did you need that for? Um, we are looking at gaming and it goes to your point. You have a message, but um, a message alone could be tedious and boring and people want to be connected and inspired. And so where is the audience or the people we used to think of as, as the receptors of things you're pushing out? So if they're participating, and if you look at a certain age group, it's gaming. And uh, we have in the works right now a history and civics um, game that um, amazing on the Revolutionary War with the kids saying, who knew that this happened? And the teachers are giving it high marks because suddenly they're finding out how it applies to them today. So you can't do the same things the way you've always done. We, ha we have a whole new generation, and if we're going to connect, and if they're going to be at least semi-educated beyond n knowing how to tweet, um, we have a huge education responsibility. Um, I was just going to add one thing about history regarding documentaries and films that are coming out of uh, or films about certain areas that contest history. So here in the United States and in a lot of parts of the world, history is something that we all agree upon. We, we know who the president, first president was. We know what kind of government we had. Unfortunately, the areas that a lot of us make documentaries and films about right now are, are the same areas that news is coming out about. And it's, it's the exact areas where history is actually the wall that keeps us from having dialogue. For example, there was a film called On the Way to School, which I have nothing to do with. Um, it's a beautiful film that, that tells you about a classroom in Turkey where the teacher is trying to teach in the main language and the, the people that are in the classroom speak a different language. And through just watching their interactions and the conflicts the teacher is having with the students, you understand how difficult it is for these people who don't want to speak the national language and the people who are trying to initiate some kind of, you know, I guess, solidarity. And the, the filmmakers, when I saw them in um, Amsterdam, they, they had this long historical opening, these cards that told the history. And I, I had been to Turkey through the, the diplomatic program, and I spoke to him afterwards, and I said, how did you get away with those cards? If you showed this in Turkey, this, those cards of history, they would walk out of the theater. And he pulled me aside, he goes, yeah, we, we took the cards out in Turkey. And that's something that's really important, um, I think, for us to understand. I just want to share with you that the people who actually benefit from some of these films, history is exactly what divides them. India, India Pakistan is a perfect example. Um, you, uh, you, you presented some history. Well, the history you presented, as much as I, I understand, it's wonderful. It's, it's so important. But what you said, unfortunately, half the room would have walked out if, if this was a, a South Asian audience because a lot of people wouldn't agree with that history. 
They don't agree that, that the conflict started with, um, you know, some of them don't agree it started with partition. Some people don't agree that there's a conflict in Kashmir because of whatever reason versus another reason. So with our documentary, for example, we had a year of conflict trying to figure out what to put on those opening cards for our film. And in the end, we put as few as possible. And so anyway, it's, it's just interesting, you know, even with Iraq, Iran, yeah, um, Darfur, these areas, there's still this sense of history that that's, that's exactly the heart of a conflict. So you almost have to leave that and get beyond it, <laughs> tell the story, mm -hmm. and, and forget history so they can remember it maybe or ask the right questions. I think so. I, we, I know we just have like literally two minutes, so I just wanted to ask each of you just the same question, but in obviously in different aspects, referring to your own personal situation, authenticity, and storytelling. How can you present that in you know when you have things like history, business, authenticity, credibility um, to deal with when you're dealing, you know, when you're trying to present a story and you have all these other factors to deal with? I think the, the real the, the the opportunity is really through the the personal story, that in fact we all wrestle with these things and therefore they become a part of a, a story that's a part of our, our our personal story. And if you enter that way, then you have opportunity to kind of take those very difficult questions on. So I think it's it's really oftentimes through the, the personal stories we can we can kind of reach some of those those difficult uh, questions. Right. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it just I just keep thinking of the old hacksaw that everybody knows here, especially in light of the the recent discussion that, you know, one death is a tragedy and 10,000 is statistics. And the s kind of stories that these films are telling, the individual, and the closer you can stay true to the person's individual truth and narrative, uh, the less you feel like you're talking and then waiting to talk again, and the more you create an opportunity for dialogue. And that's really in that sacred dialogue space is the only time that the, need, that the needle sticks. I'm going to tell you a story that I think affirms uh, actually what um, you both have just said. Um, I asked uh, Frank McCourt, the author of Angela's Ashes, who unfortunately died last year, to be one of my Culture Connect ambassadors. And we gave him all kinds of training. And we wanted him to talk to kids and not have the ambassadorial reception and all of the so-called Culture Connect ambassadors would go into very poor areas and these kids could talk to them and then they would get a little card so they could go into an internet cafe and they, they would get in touch with Yo-Yo Ma and Frank McCourt. But anyway, I'm giving Frank McCourt this whole briefing. He's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he goes uh, to talk. Uh, he, he went to Palestine and they had arranged for these kids. They were Isra Israelis, they were Palestinians. They'd been through very, very tough uh, life and still were going through it. And he opens up by saying, good morning, I'm Frank McCourt. And you think, you've had a tough childhood? <laughs> and with that, he talked about his life in Ireland. And there was such a connection. He, he actually became one of our most sought-after people because his story was their story. And it was told with such truth and such compassion and passion that he had such an impact on these young people. So I think it is the truthfulness where people know immediately this is true or it is not true. And if you stick to authenticity, you can't go wrong. Um, I would say conflict. You know, the conflict is something that is missing sometimes from, from our stories or from our films or from our media. And conflict is is authenticity on some level. There's you know there's there's different elements that brew, so to make sure that that for every you know every feeling of safety there's there's something offsetting it because that's real life. Yeah. Um, my grandfather used to say you're privileged with this grave responsibility. About uh, in the media business, it's like we are, we own a, a stadium. And to answer your question, that's what helps me keep on going back to that analogy that we don't really care, we shouldn't really care which side wins. What we should care about is that's a fair fight. And, you know, that that to me, I think, not only makes sense ideologically, but more importantly, it makes sense rating-wise and money-wise. Because imagine if you had Bill O'Reilly in the same program as Keith Lieberman? Keith Oberman. 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 
that's all I'd got to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, and please thank everyone at our panel today. Really nice. Thank you. Thank you.